basically the views of Edward Crafty, we talked about him before and uh, some more some more things that are sort of connected to this whole concept of making information visualization more interesting to mainstream audiences okay so let's talk about this so first talk about Edward Tufty in general he's this luminary guy who who was like one of the founders of visualization and he wrote these several books we talked about them I think earlier <clears throat> I actually have all of them they're very interesting reads so you can get them from the library so that's quite interesting talk a little bit about them so he was at was at Princeton and now is at Yale. That's that's him. I think a little earlier, and this is one of his books. And um, he he pop actually popularized multiple concepts that were you know just like you know Ben Schneiderman had a few claims to fame. You know Edward Tufte also has right more in the more in the basic visualiz information visualization area for example he popularized the concept of small multiples okay small multiples are also called trellis chart or panel chart basically all they really are they're just basically taking different views you know of like different aspects of a particular data set engineering here and so on assembly like put them in separate visualizations same scale same x scale just different y scales depending on what the variable is. So you can sort of compare the trends, but separately side by side, not joined together in a single visualization where they may occlude one another. So you put them side by side because it's called a small multiple because it's a, these are small usually and they're multiple, right? Usually arranged in a matrix. <clears throat> it's a pretty popular way to show data. You can really clear because it sort of focuses you on one tile at a time. You know, you're not distracted by other visualizations. Just you can look at this and then you can look to the side, compare them side by side by shape. You can see this one and this one is pretty similar, but this one is very different. You know, this has this different curve. So it's sort of a pure kind of visualization, just the curve and, and the scale, nothing else. And you, you know, a scatterplot matrix is another small multiple, right? You have different bivariate visualizations side by side and you can compare them. You know, <clears throat> so he, of course, he didn't invent small multiples. You know, he just discovered it, I guess. It's pretty old concept, actually. When you look at from 1886, there was a, there's a, a, a picture by Muybridge, which is horses in motion. So this was in 1886, you know, that actually showed, this is basically a horse as it gallops, you know, like gallops across. And this visualization really showed for the first time that horses actually can have all four legs in the air. Because people never knew this, right? People just watched these horses, but they could never figure out, is it like in four years on air or not? Because every time the horse runs, you know, you, you, you miss it, right? But now if you sort of freeze it in time, you can see here the, all four legs on the air, right? And nowhere else, right? That's the only frame where you can see it. And he just, it's just a visualization. It's not a, you know, a pretty effective, right? Horses in motion. Okay, it's a small multiple because each of these visualizations just shows the horse and the rider at different points in time, right? And you can sort of inspect it and sort of follow it like a story, you know? So that's small multiples. Then <clears throat> census charts were also done. This is by eight, in 1870, this 1870 by F.A. Walker, where the population is broken down by state and occupation. First by state, then by occupation, and then including account that, that those that, that attend school. So this is, this is actually a tree map too, if you think, right? This is a tree map and a small bottle at the same time, right? Different states nowadays, what's another famous small multiple? Those COVID curves, right? Those, those growth curves when they plateau off, right? Also a lot of small multiples, right? When you go to New York Times or anywhere like this, you see these virus maps, you know, for each state, or for each country, you see like how it's developed, you know, over time, and then how it's leveling off, right? It's also a small multiple display, right? When you go to, you know, you know, then then you'll you'll see that too. I should put the visualization of this in there. It's like another small multiple display. Well, let me let's see, right? Maybe I'll find it. You now the COVID maps, right? 
let's go here. Development uh, COVID-19 development Then you go here. I'm sure you'll see a small multiple there soon. Okay. Okay, not here. Let's be more radical and say death curve. <laughs> you know, there's not a small multiple by state. Okay, so these are these curves all at the same time, and then by by state, and you type this. Still no more multiple curve. I'm disappointed now. New York Times has it all the time. Okay, you know. So, huh. I don't know. They should usually they compare it across all the states. Okay, not here. Okay, I can't find it. So I have to put have to find it, okay? But you you may have seen it, okay? You know, you may have seen it. So that's too bad. I don't know why is maybe you have to really type in small multiples, maybe it fi fixes it. Small small. <laughs> oh, here we go. Is that it? No, that's the, that's the, ah, man. You know, when you're looking for something, you can't find it. I've seen it like many, many times. Okay, so, is that it? Oh, yeah, here we go. That's the one. Those are these COVID death curves, right? And you type, and you make it bigger, you see it like, these are small multiples for different countries. You know, you can see where, where they plateaued, okay? So anyway, let's go back to this one. So multiples are a pretty good way to compare different phenomena side by side, right? It's a pretty good way to do this. Another one he popularized was what's called spark lines. Oh, okay. Someone found it. Let's click on that. Okay. Wow. Okay. Well, one of your classmates found a better link. Let's use this one. Why will not? Oh, I can't click on it. That's so weird. Okay. Select all? No, that's not what I want to do. I do cut and paste. No, I can't. I can't get the link. That's so weird. That's so weird. I can't. I can't cut and paste the link. I cannot do that. Can't copy on Zoom. Okay, yeah. That really, that's really bad. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's too bad. Testing by state chart of new Kasich. Still not. Okay. Oh, here we go. That's another one. Okay, well, Florida, Illinois, not, not huge. I've seen much, much bigger than this, like all the states. This is a nice small multiple of the, of the hospital bed. You know, these are, these are all small multiples, right? This is nice. These are like, that's another interesting thing I wanted to show you. 
where they basically align all the all the data by the tenth first. I think the case count exceeded 100, right? That makes these curves comparable because you start them when the case count exceeded 100. You, you start all of them: Spain, South Korea, Italy, Iran, France, and China. Right? You start them at case 100, when 100, and then that sort of aligns them, and then you can compare that, right? You know, that's a nice, that's, we talked about this last time. Got to update my slides and put this in. There's a small multiple chart, different maps. These are these different, you know, trends over time. New York, Washington, California. You can sort of appreciate the different curves they make, right? Side by side, can put more information on it. You know, it's pretty nice. So, okay, so now let's talk about... <clears throat> Okay, right click service. Okay, so anyway, I'm, I'll learn from this. So now go back to what something he's he's pioneered also is called spark line. Basically, these are spark lines, teeny mini charts that are get integrated into like it's just a small box. You know, it's just that's what spark line because it, you know the small charts that sort of go into like a cell of a spreadsheet or something like this. Right, this is like very interesting, and then. This actually has inspired what's called world size visualizations, where you put the chart or graph and tightly integrate into text or even computer code. For example, here, you know, this is like basically a graph that's basically like a world. So it takes up the same, same amount of space than a regular word, but it describes like some sort of trend, like the Dow Jones index for February 7, right? It sort of integrates as a world into a piece of text. You know, it's basically world sized. You know, that's also it's kind of like a spark line, but now for world size. I think I really, I really like this kind of thing because you know a picture says more than a thousand words, right? So you basically tell the Dow Jones index. You couldn't describe it like this, right? You have to have a picture for it, right? And that's pretty nice, right? World sized visualization. Then, so according to Tufti, you know, graphical excellence is a well-designed presentation of interesting data substance, statistics, and design should be clear, precise, and efficient. Greatest number of ideas, shortest time, least ink, smallest space. Okay, so this is basically what tough thing wants. Very clean kind of presentation of data, right? No embellishment around, just the data. And this is what he calls graphical, graphical excellence, okay? And suppose, and once you have graphical excellence, Tufti says that, you know, then then you really, you achieved telling the truth of the, about the data, right? Basically, you, 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 when you're excellent, you tell the truth, right? Because you don't distort it by other side kind of shows, right? And he says visualization should be visually pleasing and have an artistic touch, but he really doesn't emphasize that much, right? Him, for him, it's more important to, to sort of be very clear and precise and just show the data only. The greatest number of ideas show is time leasing. So, so here is like a nice something I don't think I showed you before, but that's pretty good argument for visualization. Basically, if someone told you, gave you these these plots here, right? These 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 are columns of data, right? Here's like column one, two, three, and four, and this is x and y, x y x y x y, and they're independent data, and you look at them. Okay, and then you say, well, are the same or not? Are there some of them are the same? I don't know, you know, so what you can do is you can do an analysis, right? You can do, and you find out that the mean of, e, of X is the same for each of these. And the mean of Y is also the same. No, the mean is not the same, but the mean of X. Sample variance of X is the same. Sample variance of X is the same. The mean of Y is the same. And the sample variance of y is also the same. Correlation between x and y is the same, each case. And linear regression line is also the same. So basically, you would might think that these four sequences actually are the same thing. You know, you may think they're the same thing just by looking at the statistics, right? These are just numbers that you compute from them. Description, these are descriptive st statistics, right? The mean, the variance, regression line, correlation. These are pretty much those, the, the very basic descriptive statistics you can find, right? You may think that these are the same, but as a good visualization person, of course, you say, well, wait, wait a minute, you know, let me see what they look like. And then you'll see like this, 
you see this the first column, the second, the third, and the fourth. And you quickly see there is like an outlier here on the fourth, on the lower bottom. There's an outlier here that drives this regression line. If there's outlier on here, there would be no regression line, right? Here on the top left, this wheel is a true, you know, normal distributed kind of distribution, right? This is like there's some error residuals around the regression line, you know, this is basically the error, which is random, right? This is like the standard kind of way, normal distributed data, you know, some amount of mean, and then, you know, this is like the perfect case for descriptive statistics. Here, on the right hand, right hand side, we'll have a polynomial function, right? Not even a linear function, right? Of course, if you take those data points and you will compute these descriptive statistics, you'll, you'll get something, right? And it turns out to get the exact same linear line than for the other one, right? And here you get on the lower left, you get a also linear line, but it's a little tilted to what really the data looks like, right? Because it's tilted because there's this one outlier that pulled it up, right? You know, it's just the computer does what you tell it, right? I mean, it doesn't know that there's an outlier. You have to sort of know this. So this Unscom Quartet, it's called the Unscom Quartet, you know, basically from the early days, shows you the need for visualization, right, of data. Right? Don't just compute some numbers and follow them. Look at the numbers, how they look like, okay? And so when you are a statistician, you know that, right? Every statistician that plots a lot of things, right? They always do, they always visualize things in graphs or right? in plots, right? They never, they never look at the numbers only. And I took, I have a, <clears throat> I took a lot of statistics courses in graduate school and, uh, you know, we plotted a lot of stuff all the time. We would plot things, you know, to make sure we, we have a visualization. But these are usually very basic things, bivariate plots and bar charts and box plots and things like this, you know, not, nothing fancy. But when you look at, when you look at uh, some more advanced, advanced visualization books, they're often derived by statisticians, by, right? you know, the, the GGOBI, for example, is a multivariate visualization tool, which was developed by statisticians. And, and so they, <clears throat> they really have a lot of, they have put a lot of thought into how to visualize things. By plots are a statistical visualization, and there's actually a book about by plots that shows you exactly what to do. Remember, I told you that these by plots have ambiguities, right? There's some things that, that made them some points maybe plotted together, but they're really not. You know, so there's, this book has a lot of techniques how to visualize these ambiguities in some way or the other, right? So by plots, very common tool in statistics, but there's, you know, the statisticians are very aware of that these things can be, can, can tell you know, can be ambiguous. And there's a lot of methods to overcome this. They're a little bit exotic, these methods. I wouldn't say they're really mainstream, but, but they have thought about this. And we came up with this interactive uh, by plot, right? That, that, that does actually automates these, or makes these tools accessible that they had on plain paper, right? So, so we go back to that lecture and I talked about that. So anyway, so the Anscom Quartet. So anytime someone asks you, do I need visualization? All you have to go back to these four columns of numbers and plot these, these, these plots, right? And you'll, you, you have already your, 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 you know, your proof that visualization is needed, right? Because things are usually not always normal distributed, right? Very few cases, things are truly normal distributed. Most cases, they're not. And then, you'll, then you're in trouble. Unless you have a lot of numbers, then they tend to be normal distributed, right? The law of large numbers applies. But most of the time, you don't have a million data points, right? Or whatever it is, right? You have a fewer then things are not normally distributed, right? And then you'll have to look at that. So, you know, so basically outlier can have a significant effect. So outlier detection, you know, sometimes I told you outlier, outliers sometimes are important, don't want to throw them away. Sometimes they're meaningful. Some, maybe sometimes it's interesting to know. Sometimes there are, new, there are new reasons. You don't really know that, right? So, you know, but so visualization can help you, right? You can visualize it, see, oh, there's an outlier. Do I care about it? Yes, no, you know, erase it a lot. And then, you know, then you can decide what you're gonna do, you know. So I think we talked about this already, this, this, this uh, cancer, cancer map by, by, by county, age-adjusted cancer map where we found out that, you know, 
that in the lower right corner they were this is the males and these are females and we found out there's a lot more males that have cancer then we link that to asbestos in those areas from shipbuilding i think we talked about this before right so here's the male female map of cancer here's the male map of cancer and we learned there's a lot more cancer among the males than here and this is because they build ships and ships use a lot of asbestos asbestos causes cancer therefore here you have it right so basically you can now with these maps you can prove you can sort of interrogate or explore why people have cancers and then find out oh this is by the coast wait a minute they build chips what do ships use asbestos i guess asbestos causes cancer things like this right here's the galaxy map it's also from the tufty book you know divide the sky into so many rectangles and then plot the number of galaxies per, per rectangle or here's the the uh the satellites or the space debris map you know seven thousand objects 10 centimeters greater than 10 centimeters or doubles every five years i don't know when this was the 1990s so it has doubled a few times now right it's much more this is one that the <coughs> train schedule paris Lyon, where you where you show this is paris and the, the other one okay let me see i can't read this my screen is too small top is paris and the bottom is Lyon. And you see, like this is from from 1880. You can sort of see how long it took for a train to go from Paris to Lyon, right? And then you would also know when trains cross, right? There's a train crossing that goes from Lyon to Paris, and this one is going from Paris to Lyon. So they cross here. So you better make sure they don't cross on the same rail, right? You got to sort of help help them find two different rails, right? So you can build one rail train, but here you have to have some sort of you know, two, two, two rails, <clears throat> two tracks, two tracks, so they don't crash into each other, right? And you can see here, you need it again, and here you need it again, you need it again, right? And then you can also see in perspective, the train is now, right? And this, this was from 18, 1880, and this is the train Paris Lyon now, and you can sort of see, wow, you know, this train is so much faster, right? It takes so much, so, so less, much fewer, much less time to go from here to here, just a, like an hour, and the other ones needed like five or six hours, right? So you can quickly compare where I had <coughs> where the train, how the train has like, you know, if there's the train, how, how the speed of train has increased, right, over time. This is the Minar map, right? The Napoleon's travels from, you know, from France to Moscow and back. You know, we talked about this multiple times, also from the Tufty book. The Rage 4 graph is interesting. Not sure if we talked about this. You know, this is basically a glyph. Right, so this is the rage, and this is fear. And instead of putting a data point, you actually put the visualization of a dog, right? How it really looks like when it's, you know, when it's enraged and when it's fearsome. You know, on the bottom here, the dog becomes more fearsome, and the top here uh, becomes more enraged, and the pop and the, and the vertical becomes more fearsome, right? When it gets the ears sort of be like at the, are like sort of hugging hugging the body right the dog is more fearsome and here ears are like pointing up right and the snout looks like really you know we're growling and this is the dog when the dog is fearsome and great enraged at the same time right when it's fearsome you know you, you got him under control enraged you know may just growl but here if fearsome and enraged at the same time maybe you don't want to really step close to the dog anymore at this point right because this dog, dog is trying to fight for survival, right? It's at the same, it has fear and rage at the same time. So this is the kind of dog face you want to avoid to be close to, right? So here, this is okay, you know, although you shouldn't be, you know, shouldn't be intimidating dogs, right? And here, you know, you shouldn't make dogs angry. Here is the dog, you know, you, you made them angry and fearsome at the same time, you know, don't go close, right? So it's basically very expressive graph, right? Very expressive visualization. Two coordinates, rage and fear, and the actual look of the object, right? So, which is really high dimensional, right? How can you describe this dog, right? By other than by a picture, right? So it's very, very good visualization of that, right? Then people have tried to extend this to what's called churn of faces. I'm not sure if we talked about this before, but this is a high dimensional display churn of face. Try to basically try to map different, different variables to different 
parts of a face, right? Because faces, humans are very good at recognizing faces and differentiating about among faces. So why not map a high dimensional data set to a face, right? So, you know, you can put different, you know, there's different variables here, eye spacing, head eccentricity, eye size, nose length, mouth curvature, mouth width, mouth openness, and so on, right? There's all these different variables. There are all these different, you know, variables of a human face and you can basically map, uh, you know, you can map a variable to it, right? For example, salary, you can map to mouth curvature when the salary is high, you make it like this, salary is low, you map it like this. Nose width, you can, you know, you can map to like how long he's been married, you know, and then pupil size, you can map, map to the size of the house, right? whatever it is, right? You can sort of come up with certain mappings and then derive a certain face for a certain, you know, as a person, right? And then you can you can you can plot them, right? By you can basically plot them. Let's say two there's two variables x and y, and then you plot you plot these faces in that space, right? And you can quickly see whether there's like a stranger. You know, obviously this is an outlier responding to this this x and y variables, right? So that because it looks very different. These guys look the same, these guys look the same. This is like an outlet which looks very different. So you can sort of quickly see there is like something that is different because of a different, different face. You know, it's never really been overly successful in really truly being a high dimensional visualization method because can't really remember anymore like what really is, which variables really map to these different face features, right? That's a hard part, right? Well, you can make a map of it, a legend on the side. So, you know, so meanwhile, while, while this is a really nice, you can really see differences really well, it's hard to really figure out what they actually mean, you know, like, you know, unless you really come up with a convention, which is hard to come up with, right? But anyway, I wanted to show this. And here's like, you know, the uh, visualization of, of like, uh, forgot what it's called. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I forgot what it's called. So anyway, this is the, uh, someone, someone knows this. I forgot what it's called. I watched this, but I forgot the name now. You know, some cartoon, some TV characters, right? So mapped to the journal faces. Exactly, South Park. Thank you so much. Yes, South Park. I forgot. Of course, I know that, but I forgot. You know, when you teach, you always, you always forget things. So you know. So anyway, South Park. So, so basically, graphic display history. Right? We talked about the Anscor Quartet. And then, you know, reveals the numerical display and then large amount of information, very small space, data map, data map for cancer incidents was the counties, the galaxy maps, space debris map. Like there was a lot of data on a very small space, but it was very descriptive. Then time series display was the train schedule per Lyon. Can be narrative, Napoleon's Russia campaign by Minar, right? And, it, it, and then there is, you know, you can, represent each data point by visual information, for example, the journal face, right? The other age fear graph, right? So these are sort of things that are all mentioned in, 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 in I think probably the first book of top D, you know, which are like very interesting sort of, you know, ways to think about visualization, right? But you can do. So these are sort of the strengths of visualization, what you can do. And so Tufti's view on visual embellishments, right? There wasn't really any embellishment, you know, he didn't come up with this, but right? there wasn't really any embellishment. It was really just the data, right? And, and you know, maybe the right sphere graph had some embellishment, but he said any visual embellishment when, when things are beyond the data, just, you know, even the right sphere graph, the, I, the, the glyph there had, had was data, right? It was just a very complex data, but it was still data that the, the uh, you know, journal face was also data, right? It was just a lot of data and was an interesting representation, but it was still data. So he says, Tufti says, whenever there is something that is not data, just there to entertain and to be embellish and to, you know, that be, he calls that jar chuck, okay? So this is like a term to remember, right? This term jar chuck. This is not just a, you know, I don't make this up. Actually, Tufti calls it that way, right? And it's actually become a technical term, right? Whenever there's visual embellishment, it's char chunk, okay? And the abuse of physically motivated distortions, then you abuse it, and you take physically motivated distortions, but you distort, you, you abuse it, then you have this live concept of life factor, okay? So char chunk has nowadays, you know, become more, 
more 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 um, agreeable, right? So nowadays people actually use visual embellishment. That is named chart chunk actually has is has is more used in a in a more lenient context. Okay, so you know it's no longer harsh and and sort of this disparaging you know it's like chart chunk actually something you can actually use nowadays you know it's actually okay and i give you a few examples of this actually a lot of examples in the in, in the next next few pages so first this is by by tufty okay this is by tufty this is like what he calls this is like a prime example what he calls chart chunk okay which goes because this is the diamond vera girl's best friend basically it's like the diamond price over time which is really supposed to go down right the diamond price actually went down over time the lag here goes down and but the, everything else is really just all you really want all you really needed is one 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 line that goes down right or some sort of you know regression line maybe maybe linear maybe a little bit curved in any case right but for some reason this person you know came up in a newspaper has decided to embellish it with some you know you know interesting look interesting image or interesting interesting drawing to draw the viewer's attention to it right like if you don't care about the diamond prize over time when you see this picture you think huh, what is this all about right you know and then you step by the way you also look at the data right you look at and you look at other things too but you look at the data as well and maybe hopefully you remember that as well right so this is basically the intent of creating such a picture Right, you, you draw the pic, you, you make the you make the person look, right? First make the person look, and then draw the person in and to, to with the intent to not only look at the cartoon but also to look at the data themselves. Okay, so here I'm, I made you look because I drew this, this 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 cartoon here, right? And then by the way, you're also discovering, oh wait a minute, the diamond price is going down. The problem with this is basically what Kafti says. Because you remember this picture, you know, and I'll show you a little bit more about memorable visualizations in a, in a few slides down the road. You know, you may remember the wrong thing. You may remember only the headline, diamonds and girls, best friend. And you may remember only that the, the other foot was pointing upwards. And you may remember something with price, you know, average. You may remember something with average price. You remember, you maybe remember the word diamond. And you may remember the shape of the curve, which looks upward, but actually it's the wrong curve, right? You're supposed to look downward, right? This other leg is the one that really matters and not this one, okay? So I still don't see why this visualization is good. Yeah, exactly. That's what Tafti says. The other leg doesn't represent anything, but you know, people, <laughs> humans have two legs, right? And this, this posture here goes well with the theme of the picture, right? You know, it looks like a, you know, a cabaret dancer on stage or something like this, right? They usually look like this, right? Watch the, watch the movie Cabaret with uh, Lisa Manelli, right? This, that's what they look like, right? You know, of course, yeah, Tafti says too, this, this, pick, this, this leg doesn't present anything and it's actually something very dominant. And then you may, it may mislead you, right? So, you know, that's basically what he says. So another example is this, this, um, um, Nigel Holmes chart of monsters costs um, total the, the total house and senate campaign expenditures expenditures in millions okay so you know you see this so basically he wants to point out that the costs are monstrous you know because they really have escalated tremendously right from like from 1972 there were just 50 I guess mil, million and now they're 300 right so it's it's a lot more right so it's obviously a monster and why not draw a monster there right it's an artist right nigel holmes is an artist the graphics artist right so you know he drew this it's a monster and he made the teeth made they made the teeth as the bar chart right so it's like try to monsters have teeth the teeth are you know they rise up right so it's like a bar Right, so it's like you know, it's a very smart, clever way to show the data, right? With a, you know, with this, this, these teeth and the monster, and even has these lines, right, across. So you can sort of see the, the the scale of it, right? You know, it, it makes you look right. It's it's really, really a very famous embellished chart chunk kind of visualization. 
not by a visualization expert, by Nigel Holmes, who is like really a graphics artist. But you know, you could also look at this bar chart on the other side, right? That shows the campaign uh, expenditures, right? But you know, this is really boring, right? And this is very interesting, right? You, if you remember, if you had to remember one of them, you would probably remember this one, right, on the left, not the one on the right. And I'm getting to this in a second. Actually, people have measured this, and I'll show you some some studies on this next. Okay, but but anyway, this is. And people have discussed this in the beginning. This was like people were really, you know, sort of put off by this. But nowadays, people admire this visualization actually because it's actually a really nice and really nice way to show the data and make people look at it, you know. But it's hard to design, right? If you are, you have to be an artist to do this, right? Not everyone can make something like this, right? You have to really be someone like Nigel Holmes, like to make this, you know. So this is another one charge. This is another. Thing where this is misleading scaling, you know, where this everything rises up, but actually there is loss here, you know, but it, it's rising up, right? So this is actually, you know, these this losses, to, you know, these are actually positive. Everything seems to be like tall, but it's not really tall, right? Then here, this is the other one that we showed before, the the gun the gun death in 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 Florida, right? Number of murders committed using firearms. 2005, you know, this is the year on the x-axis, and this is the number of murders. And so here they want to show that 2005 Florida enacted the stand stand your ground law. Okay, and when you look at it, you but basically all you see is the gun death in Florida. Okay, so when you are a, a viewer of a visualization, what and the people have studied this too, and I'll show you experiments on that as well in the future slide. So. People usually look at the title very quickly. So whenever you make a visualization, title is very important. Okay, title is very important. So gun deaths in Florida, the headlines, basically a headline, just like in newspapers, you know, then 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 you know, then you know, then then like in newspapers, you look at the headline first, and and then a small print, that the smaller headline usually you get this look at this too, and you look at text. You know, that's because remember we did this experiment. Uh, you had to label text uh, a piece of text that was colored you know that you, you you always write the text before you recognize the color same thing with humans every human if it's in your language people people read especially when it's not a lot to read right so you, you read the gun that's in florida you read the number of murders committed using firearm 2005 florida enacted this then you look at the you look at the shape of the curve you see something happened what is it and it went down right then you walk away from this if you just spent like a minute on it and then you browse through you think wow you know these guys in florida they they have this law called the stand go ground law and they, they enacted it and the gun gun death went down but you don't really study this sufficiently you don't realize that this is actually upside down right you don't see zeros on the top and 800s on the bottom this is really you know this is actually flipped over right actually the you know, when you flip it the other way around, actually that the, the gun that went up after they did this law, right? But not down. And this is really a real, from a real brochure. It comes from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. This is not something like a student made up. This is really real thing that appeared in an official government brochure, okay? Official government brochure. Misleading to the extreme, right? Misleading to the extreme, okay? But you know, but it, it basically capitalizes on humans, humans uh, way to look at data, right? Like look at visualizations, like look at the headline first, look at the shape of the curve, read a little bit about it, like something that's pointed out on a curve and draw a conclusion. People assume that, the, that, that, the, the, that this goes to the left to the right in terms of the year and goes from the bottom to the up in the axis, right? People don't assume that it goes from top down. Right, so you know, so this is basically, you know, taking advantage of people's habits. So, next thing here is this compute commission payments to travel agents. You think, wow, you know, over time this commission payment got down, but this is only half year. Right, you have to actually read. This is only the half year. Actually, it's going to go even further. Right, go even further. But here, you think 78, 70, 77, 76, 77, 78. Okay, commission payments go down. Great, you know, it's good now. But actually, this is only half the year, right? So this is basically the scale has changed. Then also this one here, we talked about this as well, I think, in, in the past. 
this fuel economy standard for autos in the 1970s, when the, when the oil crisis was, right? So you wanted, the government wanted to show that the, you know, that they're gonna do something about the economy, fuel economy. And this is like, you know, they wanted to show this. And so this is, a, you know, the, the gallons, the miles per gallon, you know, 18 and now it's 27. So, you know, eight, when you look at this effect, right, when you compare 18, when you do 27 minus 18, which is like what's going to happen between 85 and 79, right? Or 78, 78. You know, then, then you'll see, you'll find out it's, it's over and you normalize it by 18, which is this one, then the real effect is 53%. You're going to make it 53% better, okay? But then the graphical effect, when you, when you take these two lines, where you take this line here minus this line here, the length of the line, then you're going to normalize it, then you're going to get 70, 783%. So basically you, with this picture, you suggest that the fuel economy gets gets basically 14 times better than it really gets, right? The life factor is 14.8, right? You take this percentage over this percentage, 14.8, you actually suggest to the, to the innocent user, to the naive user, naive viewer, that, that you know, you're gonna increase the fuel economy by 15 times more than it really is, just by looking at the picture. You know, it's nothing wrong with this picture, right? This, you know, you, you draw the numbers, you write the numbers, but they make the graphical effect really bad. And you make it plausible to the viewer because, you know, when you look at perspective and it is a road, roads always narrow towards the horizon, but the horizon is usually the future and the present is in the beginning, but here the future is in the beginning and the, right, the past is in the future, right? So this is actually totally wrong, right? So this is like an, a terrible example for like lying, which we should say, come from New York Times. You know, this is a terrible example, right? It's like, all the little, all the tricks that people have down their sleeves are used here. Perspective distortion, different mapping, lines that are vastly, vastly, vastly bigger than, than the real, the reality is. All of this stuff sold by, by graphics, right? By graphical confusion, right? They sell, tell the lies by confusing people with graphics, right? So this is like really, really a great example for lying with visualization, right? Then what you really should show is this way, right? You should show the data on a line like this, right? You should really show it like this. Like, you know, 1878, 18 mile gallon, 7.5 in 85, right? So what usually happens with technology, in the middle you have a big growth because you really, really, here you're learning it. Now you're really, really, you know, making it better and here you're sort of leveling off by right? you're squeezing the last part of this technology whatever you do right so this is a typical growth curve you know always has a quick it has like a slow beginning then it rises really fast and then it goes back you know levels off right and then it's the, and then you have to find a new technology to make it right so Tafti says this is how you should show your data yeah but maybe people don't really look at it people will look at this and get something out of it which is of course the wrong thing People don't really look at these boring graphs, right? He says, if you must embellish, then embellish the surrounding, but put the graph inside, right? This is a kind of a joke, you know, but, but you know, but anyway, that's what Tufti says, right? I mean, of course, he's a joke, right? Not really true, but this is embellishing, makes people look, and then you look what's inside, right? And you learn about the data, right? So, you know, I haven't really seen a lot of this, but, you know, but, you know, we'll, 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 I'll show you an example that you that actually makes use of this kind of thing. I'll show you an example of this actually stuff we have published recently. You know, so barrel is another one, right? When you look at the price per barrel of light crude oil leaving Saudi Arabia on June 1, this also from the 1970s. You know, when you look at the height of it, 13, 13 gallons, uh, 13 dollars, two dollars, right? When you just compare the height of these barrels, then it's really the truth. But when you look at it, people don't look just look at the height of the barrels. People look at the area at the very least, or even the volume of the barrel, right? They think, wow, this is a teeny weeny bar barrel, and this is a massively huge barrel. You know, they think this is like very amazingly much more you pay per barrel, barrel than here, right? But it's not that much, you know, it's only, it's only six times more, but this is like probably 60 or 80 times more, right? 
because if you just look at the volume of the area, right? So it's again misleading. You you suggest something, right? It's a, it's it it basically makes you outraged when you look at it, right? You just look at it in the barrel price per gallon. You know, you look at this teeny weeny barrel on the left and the big huge amazing barrel on the right. You think, wow, this price has increased like massively, and it basically makes you makes sensual, sensationalizes it. But it's really, it's still bad, but not that bad, right? Not that bad, right? So this is basically a graphical trick to mislead you into thinking something that is really not there, right? Another thing is this one here, show the data in proper context, okay? So this, this data set is here, I um, have to read it. Before strict law enforcement, the connect, connective traffic deaths, okay? Before strict enforcement, after strict enforcement, okay? So this basically, when you just look at this, you know, this is 19, what is it? Um, you know, from one year to the next, it went down a lot, right? You're like the strict, you, there was no strict, and that year you, traffic deaths were really high, then you strictly enforced it, the law, and then it went down. So, you know, this is, this is all you show, right? And you think, wow, you know, great, this has really helped. And if this were really the real, the real curve, the one on the bottom here next, you'd say, well, you know, this is cool. Okay, it really has, has helped, right? And it has gotten even better, you know, has helped. But the trend doesn't have to be that way. The trend could have also been like zigzag around like this. You know, it went up, went down, then it went up again, went down, went up again. Or it could, it could really be like this, which is really good, right? It went up and then someone put the law and it went back down. And here it was up all the time. And went back down, right? So there's different stories, right? Different contexts, you know. And then it's also in relation with other other states, right? So, you know, but you want to show the context because otherwise it's just only like shows. It could be this, could be this, or could be this. All of them are possible, right? So you know, you gotta show the past and the future to really show that it really had had a long term effect and that it really wasn't just a you know some periodic behavior it didn't 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 really make any difference right so there's another context you know new york stock prices and london stock prices they're correlated and then the solar radiation in it this basically the solar radiation is drawn well shown in context of these stock prices but you know this is completely wrong context right these correlation spurious right it's not really existing but you know you can plot it and there's a lot of these examples that that do that remember it's like you know correlate there's a Google website that shows you lots of these spurious correlations, you know, that you can just, you know, stuff like that. And so again, to the rules of graphical excellence, cosmetic decoration really needed to make the data more interesting. He asks, you know, diamond graph, it's useless to dimension. Then misleading graphical representations, you know, we talked about this commission payment, uh, payments and the date, the, uh, the, the commission report, you know, and then the life factor, size of effect, showing the graphics, size of effect of data. And you really, really, when you design a visualization, especially infographic, right, try to keep it between 0.95 and 1.05. Don't exaggerate the size in the graphics, you know, make it sort of similar, okay, in, in terms of like the ratio of it, right, the, you know, the difference, you know, should be the same, you know. And here we also showed you some. You know, when you abuse, when you abuse like what, pe what models that per people have in their heads, you know, abuse it to make things bigger than they really are, right? When you look at a barrel, people think of a barrel as a three-dimensional object, but if you only mean that the height of the barrel, then basically you make, you, you're sending a message that people should think in barrels as they remember it, but you really only mean the height of the barrel, right? So this is a, you know, you know, you, you, you're not doing anything anything you're not really lying you know by by you're lying by design right you don't really you know you just sort of between the lines are lying right between the lines it's it's you know you could you could justify well i wanted to make a barrel because people remember it better right because it's a barrel right and then oh my god i didn't know that people actually think of barrel as an object and related to the size right you know so you know you have an excuse but but you know Anyway, you know, this is kind of the tricks you can play. You know, advertisement plays a lot with these tricks. Government reports shouldn't really do that. Company reports shouldn't really do this, right? But, you know, 
many times do it. So now I don't know. I hope I have not told you how to lie. I hope I have told you that you shouldn't lie. You know, you know, anyway, these are the tricks that people can use, right? So anyway, don't I don't recommend any of this, okay? So you know, I want to make you aware of it that people use these tricks and you don't not do these things, okay? Then graphical integrity, basically representative numbers should be directly proportional to numerical quantities. Clear and detailed labeling should be there. Data variations are not design variations. Time series, you know, show it in standardized units. You know, the information information carrying dimensions should not exceed the data dimensions. That was like the barrels, for example. You know, don't put it out of context. It was the traffic death example I showed. And, and you know, and, and uh, remember the challenger disaster graphics that I showed you in the beginning of this class, right? You should really show cause and effect, right? And then go back to the introductory lecture and I talked uh, talked about the challenger example, right? Where there are people where you should really, you know, explain the disaster by 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 graphic and not by ridiculous, ridiculous uh, uh, icons. Okay. So let's talk about more recent research, you know. By, by, you know, not by Tufti's work is pretty old, but I really, you really should know it because there's a lot to know, learn about it. So let's go a little more, like, more recent to the recent state of visualization, okay, so where people ask, do bear graphs engage a human audience? Are they memorable? Okay, so, you know, will embellishment help memorability and engagement? You know, do we will need what Tufti calls chart jump? Okay, so, you know, so. So here was an experiment that Borkin, uh, Michelle Borkin and collaborators uh, set up. You know, <clears throat> you can read that paper. So basically I did a game on Amazon Mechanical Turk. Okay, when Amazon Mechanical Turk is this platform where you can, where you can post mini like micro tasks, right? And, and allow people to, to exact, allow people to, you know, to, to solve that task. You have to become a Turker, you know, sign up the account, and then every time you solve a little task, then you get like a very small amount of money, like on an order of pennies. Okay, so basically these workers, which are called the Turkers, they were presented with a sequence of images, about 120 images. You looked at one image at a time, so you can do this on a smartphone, presented for one second, and there was 1.4 second gap between consecutive images. Okay, you look at one image for one second, then there's no, there's a blank, blank screen and then the next one comes. And then workers had to press a key when they saw an image for the second time in the sequence, okay. And usually what the, what working it out, what the, the, the researchers did, they usually put a repeating image, like one to seven images, you know, they put sort of one to seven images in between, okay, spacing one to seven images with filler images in between. So they basically put some other images in between that you may that you may later on have to remember be, be asked again or not. Anyway, you wouldn't, you know, there would be some space in between that you had enough time to 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 fill your working memory with other impressions, but you could still maybe remember it, right? And basically try to see if it sticks, right? If you have seven images in between, remember seven, seven is this number where, where, where it's kind of hard to keep everything at the same time in working memory. So if you saw an image and you remember it seven images later, then you know, then then you probably have remembered it well. You know, that something was there that made you think about made that made made it stick. Okay. You know, so here, here it is experiment. So turns out the most memorable most memorable images were those ones on the left. Okay. So those were like, you know, they saw this guy with the, with the, you know, with this 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 coach, this 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 umpire here. Seven image five one one to seven images in between something else and they saw it again they said ah, I see this again they clicked the, the button I've seen it before right and all of these basically they are most memorable most you know how many users were there too you know I don't I forget how many of them were there but a lot of them they so this was really found by most many users as memorable they they remembered it when they saw it the second time right and then these ones were also most memorable but these were all the images where the, the human recognizable cartoons were removed, right? So here there was a human recognizable person, right? There is this bicycle, which is human recognizable. There's this tree, which is human recognizable. There's this, 
you know, these dinosaurs or human organisms. These are basically, this is the set of images that are also most memorable after removing all the images that had human recognisable objects in them, right, again. And these are the least memorable. So what you can learn from this basically is, you know, these are not memorable because, you know, would you remember them? Probably not, right? They're just a bunch of bar charts, right? It's the kind of stuff that Tafti says we should, we should use, but no one remembers it, right? You know, so, you know, that, that's the problem, right? They're informative, but they're just not very memorable, memorable right? You don't remember the trend, right? That's why this lady with the, the this, this woman with the, the, the point, the foot pointing up, the leg pointing up, was easy to remember because it had a human recognizable object in it. And then, but it was misleading because it pointed up, right? So you would think the trend would go, go up and not down, right? So anyway, so anyway, this is an interesting study. I like, really like this paper a lot, right? It's really, really insightful, right? So this sort of, now you sort of tell what, so what does it tell you, right? So number one thing, if you make an infographic that has a human recognizable object in it, people remember it more. Secondly, if you make an infographic that has color in it and looks, you know, doesn't look, is not just a basic chart, is a little bit, has something in it, you know, that, that is, that has a, a design in it, right, some sort of design, right, you're going to remember it more too. Here it's just a chart, right, that's all it is, and one out of millions of charts, you know, the curves and tables and numbers, right, no one, you know, it's hard to remember what the trend really looked like, but here you accentuate it in some way or not, right, so, you know, so basically, so, so also she studied, so this is the takeaway from this, right? Human recognized objects, color and, and, and shapes, things like this are good, are easy to remember, right? So remember when we talk infographics, shapes are good, color are good, interesting, you know, pictograms are sort of recognizable, right? They're object, they're recognizable objects, right? Pictogram, and you make like, several of them, right? You can sort of see how many there are proportions you can get out of it. So pictograms are also pretty memorable. Okay, so here she did the same study. What do people remember, right? To figure out what is it that people remember. So in this case, in this visualization, so there, there was another experiment. So it would have like 393 visualizations was labeled, you know, there was a label there and then, you know, the, you know, the label was, and then there were basically, you would show them, you would show people 100 target visualizations and did eye tracking on them, right? So these people looked 10 seconds per image and their eyes were tracked, okay? And then these are the average, these hotspots here are basically the average eye maps, right? The tracking maps So people, you know, some people look at, so you can see like people really look at the titles, really nice, right? People look at it, of course they look in the middle first, you know, everyone looks at the middle of the picture first, but they really, we really inspect the titles and these numbers, right? We really inspect these numbers. Then recognition. So look, you know, look when people, people, this, when people recognize the picture, you know, then figure out what people looked at, right? People figure out what people looked at. Again, they looked in the middle, but they also looked at the title. Okay. So people really look at titles. You know, this was like hundred fillers in between, right? Same hundred targets and hundred fillers. So there would be, you look at the target, try to remember it, then, but with eye tracking in there, so you figure out what people looked at, then some filler images, then the image, then image again, and see if they remember it and what they look at, right? So here, and then this is recognition, right? To figure out what is it that people recognize, a title, and then some other things, right? And then recall is basically, you give them, there was like 20 minutes later, you showed a blurred image, okay? So not the real image, just a blurred version of it. And just by the blurring basically hides some of the detail from the picture, right? So you couldn't really read what the picture was about. You could just sort of, it helped you like, basically it gave you a little bit of support and remembering to basically look up what you learned from that picture. So basically what they had, what they had to do was, they saw this blurred version that didn't really have the detail of the data and then they had to write down what they remembered from that picture, right? So they gave the blurred version as a, as a memory support, right? You would like, so we would like, so you could look it up. Remember what I told you, right? You oftentimes you only remember blurry kind of things. You don't remember quite the whole detail, but you remember blurry kind of things. And then 
maybe you remember some facts about it, right? That you store in a different part of the, of the working memory, right? So people, the experiment was basically 20 minutes later, people were shown blurred versions of the image that they had seen before, at least some of them. And then they, for each of these blurred versions, they had to make text descriptions what they what they learned, you know, what they still remember from those. So what's interesting about this is, is like recognition, right? So the least recognizable, you know, people looked, you know, here, this is what the, this was the encoding when they first looked at it. And this was the recognition. The first row is the encoding when they first looked at it, when they primed the memory. And the second row was the recognition phase where they saw a few fillers and had to, had to saw it again, right? And what, what they looked at, right? So when they, when they recognized it, they didn't, they just looked at the beginning of the text, right? They, they quickly figured out what to look at. And when they're not recognizable, they looked all over, right? They searched around. They basically here they searched. They, they searched, they tried to find out what, what should I remember? And then here they searched again because they couldn't remember it because it was not rememberable. Right, so you know, so it's a very interesting experiment. And what to take away from this really is that you know, these are guidelines for you for your visualizations, right? These are these were from three online three visualizations of thirty three participants and 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 <clears throat> thousands of you know text descriptions. So what to basically what take away from this from this from this this part of the lecture is, and you can see this here in this. What the, the what they remember, right? What is the part they remember? Okay, you know the textual elements are mem mentioned most often in description. Remember they made these descriptions here at the recall portion, right? So what did they remember most? The, most people remember the title, like most people remember the title of the picture of the visualizations, and then lots of people remember the label, and if there was some paragraph text, they would remember the paragraph. So data were remembered too, of course, you know, the source and the, some other things were not remembered so much. Access wasn't remembered as much. Legend wasn't remembered as much. But really, what you really need to have a visualization, when you make a visualization, what you really need to have is a, a text, a title. So title, without a title, visualization is really useless, right? You must have titles, okay? And you must provide labels, okay? Labels are very, very important. Like, Legend, put the legend, put the label on the axis. Remember what I told you in your labs, like with visualization without labeling of the axis is ridiculous. Put put some put some text inside of it to highlight what you want the user to look at, right? That's also fine, right? Make it redundant, you know, make things redundant, like have things mentioned a few times, like have it here and have it here, you know, point really make it redundant, you know. And, and pictograms are also pretty good, but because they're human recognizable objects, right? So that's also can improve recognition, okay? So, you know, basically visualizations that are memorable at a glance are also capable of effectively conveying the message of the visualization, you know? So most often a memorable visualization can also be an effective one, right? Because you remember it at a glance, if you remember it, then you, it must have stuck to it, right? Because you remember the data too, right? You remember something about the visualization. So obviously it was effective, right? Because you remembered it and you carried it with you and it, it gives you additional knowledge, right? And it, it makes you a more informed person, right? So these are the rules how to do it, right? So attributes are color, inclusion of human recognizable object. We talked about this, right? That's very important, you know, but Human engagement is not, you no, know, it's really, it, you cannot, the problem is you cannot quite link it to human engagement. You know, it's memorability. You cannot really link it directly that someone actually studied the data, right? You know, you can't, that is the problematic part, right? You, you, you can, no one has really proven that they really remember the data very well. They remember the subject, they remember some parts of it, but they don't. So if you put the date in the title, what you want to say with the information, if you put it in the title, what you want to inform the visualization to say, then you convey the message, right? You basically convey the message, what the visualization is supposed to say, and then people can look at the visualization and, and get proof, right? This is a good way to do it, right? Title very explicit, you know, COVID-19 happens a lot in rural, in rural, in rural counties, right? This is, the, this is the message, right? This is the message, what you want to say. And then the picture shows what it really means, right? how to prove it, right? So this is really a good way to show data. The title has the message, 
and then the picture shows the shows the the, the proof, right? And then it makes it big, makes the human makes it how basically hammers it in that it's really true, right? Because if you just see a title without proof, people don't trust it. But if you show the visualization and the proof, you know, but if you show that that the message and the proof with it, it's a good package for people to see, right? So. You know, it's an, you know, our own studies also show that embellishments can get humans interested in starting image, but you know, but it turns out when, when, when you, like we actually did a study on this, like we showed people magazines with embellished visualization, we showed them scientific articles with embellished images. We also showed them magazines with nice bar graphs and, and in scientific magazines with scientific journals, scientific papers with bar graphs. Turns out people, tend to like the embellished images with magazines, but they don't want really the embellishment, embellished images in papers. They want really the bar charts, like the very basic stuff. They want that in papers, right? It's just, so there's a place for everything, right? So if you write a nice, if you write a scientific paper, then, you know, you want to like use like traditional visualizations, bar chart, pie chart, like just the raw stuff, you know, maybe some color, that's okay, but not like anything embellishing on it. But, you know, if you have, you know, if you have a, <clears throat> if you have a site, if you, a site, if you have a magazine article, you can use embellishments. Okay. So, for example, here this would be something you put in a in a, in a scientific paper. You know, this is the top five lipstick survey results. You know, in different colors, different you know different pie, like the pie chart shows you how much of it. And this is something that we created. This is basically an embellished one that shows that also shows a pie chart here, right? But there's the human face on it, and there's the lip stick because it's about lip sticks, right? So it's the lip is the carrier of the data, right? So you can see like, and the, the basically the same thing happened here, right? That the different, you know, the different, this a pie chart slightly distorted, but we, we optimized it to limit the distortion, right? And then you can sort of get the same message. So now, you know, it's more entertaining. It's kind of like the, the it's kind of like this, 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 this Tufty's leg, right? It's like entertaining. And, and, and factual at the same time, right? You know, so that's this one. Then this is a nice visualization by also Borkin about visualization sources and origins. You know, so you can see here, this is the government, world organizations, news media here, infographics, scientific publications. You can learn that bars are most often used in government reports and news media. There's a lot of bars, but here in scientific publication, not so much. More diagrams are used more often in, in infographics and scientific publications, not so much in government reports. Circles are shown a lot in government reports because these are the pie charts, right? Same thing in infographics, but not often in scientific publications and news media. You know, there's other things here. Diag what, what else is there to see? You know, uh, there's other things that are sort of similar uh, lines that goes with the bar charts. You can sort of see where to publish what, right? So bar charts in these reports, what I told you, right? The serious stuff, right? Infographics uses tables, more diagrams, more entertaining things, the diagrams you can study, they look at it, right? So it's more like something you can you can see. You know, so these are like also studied by Borkin. They, they did basically they analyzed a ton of these kind of data sets and kind of these of these reports and so on to figure out what is there. Okay. So <clears throat> You know, should be presented quickly and cleanly. You know, and and this this is infographics. We talked about infographics, right? We talked about it last time. You know, so it's entertaining, but it still expresses the opinion of the author, right? This is the infographics. This is the this is the uh, uh, this is the voucher. This is the the graphic the visualization for it, right? So obviously, here you know the bad players in the bad players in 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 in, in environment are all here, you know, here actually there's only really two, two bad players and the other ones are not that bad, right? But by just, by just putting either here or here, a lot more people, a lot more companies appear bad, although they're not that bad, right? There's only really two bad players, Monsanto and then this other one, right? So, you know, by infographics, you, you choose to, to, you choose to disregard some information and, and emphasize other, right? Here, you just basically, thresholded it, right? Everything above a threshold became bad and everything below a threshold became good, right? So, you know, so you make a choice, right? You simplified it, 
you know, made it more entertaining, but at the same time, you know, that's it. So, so here is another way, um, use icons as bar graphs. Right? So it's sort of like an interesting mix, right? You have a bar graph, but at the same time, you, you make the bar graph more entertaining instead, instead of like this. You, you, there's the wine consumption, for example. So use a wine bottle, right? You know, so use a wine bottle. So here's the wine bottles and you just map the height of the bar to the level it is filled, right? You know, stuff like this. So here's car, you know, you can, what is this, you know, number number of cars, sales, the sales, I see the sales for cars, where it's a mid-sized cars sells a lot and then subcontent sells a lot and pickup doesn't sell so much. You know, so I don't, I don't know what, it, what the data exactly was, but anyway, there's rules how to design it. Right, map it to map it to the data, map it to the data, or it should be obvious. Here's the Nigel's Nigel's uh, uh, monstrous monstrous chart again, right? Where you where you basically scale the teeth by the data, right? You can scale it different ways, right? Doesn't matter because once you parameter, the idea is basically you parameterize this, right? The tooth becomes the bar. And you can then you parameterize it by the height, right? So you can just pull the tooth up or put it down to put different data on it, right? You know, so everything's now monstrous chart, right? No matter what it is, right? You can just parameterize the height of the, the tooth. And so same thing you can do this here, right? You can you, you can take this base visualization, parameterize it by different by the by the data set itself, right? Here this is by Kim et al. That that <clears throat> That did this to an extreme, like parameterize a lot of these things, like pregnant, you know, the effect of age on fertility, you know, so this this basically map the age and so on, right, to to you know fertility and so on, right. So this basically try to entertain and use a parameterization of these icons, these visual icons that you scale up to to basically you know convey the data. Right, so this is essentially what this does, right? It uses this and then you, you make it slightly different, kind of like the journal faces, right? Try to map data to an expression of the, of the shape, right? But, but, you know, that's basically what this is, right? And I wanted to show you, right, these, this one is really fascinating, right? This one here. And then you, you can basically, when you go here, not here, not here. When you say when you say this word silhouette, okay, in Google Image, is let's say you say this word silhouette. Ah, I can pull it up. When you say this word silhouette, just say now silhouette, you know, bottle. Right? If you say silhouette bottle, and you go to Google Image, you get it. Right? You get a lot of bottles. Right? You say silhouette, you know, silhouette, uh, you know, silhouette uh, sales. I wonder what you get, right? You, know, you get like, you know, this is not so good, but, but you know, but you get people here. But the silhouette, silhouette for sales is not deep. Silhouette, um, um, you can even do silhouette depression, right? So it's a deal of silhouette depression. Okay. You can get a person who's depressed, right? So you can now fill it, right? You can say, you know, movies make you this depressed. Or, Files make you dis dis depressed. Bad grades make you even more depressed. But right? you can basically use this to fill a pie chart or a bar chart, right? Just the silhouette. The silhouette becomes a, a carrier, and 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 you know, you know, you can also silhouette baby, right? Let's do something nice. Okay, baby. Okay. So you get a baby, right? You can say like, okay, age different ages have different kind of number of babies, right? This becomes like the bar. And this, this, and then you fill it more or less, right? You can get these, you can really get these silhouettes very easily, right? From just with Google image, right? Just say, you would silhouette and you got it. So last lecture I want to give you, like, is this, this concept called Memvis that we created. And, and just, just now it's just about to be presented at the, at the Eurographics conference. So I have this, this video here that I'm going to show. Um, I'm going to have to, Enable the sound. Okay, so now I'm enabling the sound. So, so now let's play this video to learn about. You know, I told you about all this stuff that you can do. You know, when when you mapping the data into an image, right? Where the data itself is reserved. Remember what Tafti told you? Like you should keep the data alone, but but have some interesting thing around it. This is essentially what we did with this with this work here.
We present a tool that allows novices to create info mages. The interface has five main areas. The resource input area where users can import their data and select a background image retrieved from the web or import their own image. The canvas area where users can preview the information and manipulate the chart elements. The chart editing tools, which allow users to set various properties of the chart, such as the color, glow, size, axis, and various other properties. The distortion estimation indicators that inform users about possible distortions in the various encodings. The post-processing tools, which allow users to format the text elements and apply image filters to the background, giving the information artistic style. The tool allows users to import data from CSV files. Once a data file is selected, the data is loaded into a table, and a plot is generated in a preview pane. Our tool also retrieves images associated with the topic of data from the web. Users can either select one of these images, or import their own image. Let's move on to InfoMage creation. We start with the fill style InfoMages. To start off, we load the lipstick data set. The tool loads the data and retrieves a set of images related to lipstick. It would be nice to fill in an image of a woman's lips with the data. We do so by using the fill tools to embed the data. To fill the lips, we need to mark the lip area by creating a mask. This is done by using the masking tool. Here, draw a box around the object to be filled, in this case the lips. Then click on Generate Mask. This segments out the lips. We also provide tools to refine the selection if the object is not perfectly selected. Since the lips are perfectly cut out, let's move on to styling the info mage. Users can select color schemes from a set of predefined color palettes. They can modify the colors if they prefer to do so. Users can also specify how the region should be divided. They can select from radial, horizontal, and vertical. In this case, radial seems to be the most suitable. Users can also specify the encoding upon which the chart will be radially divided. They can choose between angle, area, or arc length. The center of the pie chart can also be moved, and label distance from it can be changed. Once they are done, the info mage can be saved as an image. We can also fill multiple objects in an image. Here, let's select the American troops in Afghanistan data set. For bar-like charts, images with multiple objects of similar size are preferred. As there are three data items, we will use an image with three soldiers. We have to create a mask for each of the three data items. This can become quite a tedious process as the number of data items increases. Once we have our masks created, we can edit the chart. We can change the color, offset the labels, as well as change the fill method. Now, let's move to overlay style info mages. To start off, we load the traffic deaths data set. Again, the tool loads the data and retrieves related images. On selecting different images, the line chart is auto-aligned with certain objects in the image. While the placement of the chart is appropriate, it can be changed to a more refined or desirable position. Other properties of the chart such as its width and height, line color, thickness, and glow can be set as well. Additionally, the line can be changed from a sharp line to a smoother spline. Users can change the axis limits and the label spacing. Just like line charts, bar charts can be overlaid on an image. Here the trend formed with the bar peaks is aligned with certain objects in the image. After placing and coloring the chart, users can add finishing touches to edit the background. We can apply various filters to the background of the chart, thereby changing the possible interference it may have on the data. Text can be moved around, modified, and styled. In addition to embedding the data, we also estimate the amount of distortion in the chart. 
For example, in this case we tried to embed a pie chart into a pair of lips. Since the lips are not shaped like a perfect circle, some amount of distortion is caused to the data. At the bottom right, we report the distortion amount as a percentage error communicated through gauges. We report the error for all three encodings, in this case, area, angle, and arc length. We also report the average error across all three encodings. Users can also access a pop-up that shows the actual data values versus the erroneous encoding. In this case, since we used a pie chart, we show the comparison with a nested donut chart. The inner donut in green shows the true data values while the outer donut in blue shows the erroneous values. We also allow the user to optimize for all three encodings. Here, we use simulated annealing to minimize the error. For details, please refer to our paper. Okay, so this was work by uh, my student, uh, Darius Coelho, who is a PhD student of mine. So, is this tool extensible? For, to any, yeah, sure. Any type of um, any any type of image you can just. So what we do usually with it is um, you can just take the attribute names and the title. Maybe if you had like a data set with a title and with some attribute names, you type that into you <clears throat> cut and paste that into Google Image, and then you'll see what you what what kind of images you get, and then you can just cut it. You just can drag it into the into the tool. So this is not isn't it's a it's a <laughs> it's not a web-based tool. It's, it runs its own application, but but you know you can any type of image goes in whatever whatever you feel, and then you'll have to decide if you want to do a pie chart, fill an object, or if you want to do a bar, bar chart, you want to like, or or then you have to find individual items, or you you can fill a shape from left to right as in a bar, or you can do a line chart fitting a line to some sort of you know. Growth and so we 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 do like a Huffman half encoding to find interesting patterns in the data, right? Where we can sort of show show you slopes that are sort of go well with the line that you have, right? So we we give some assistance to the to the to the user. So it's a pretty good tool. You can it's on GitHub now, so you can you can get it from there. Okay. So there's no more. If there's any more questions, we are at the end of this lecture. So you know so. I'll put this online. Okay, so that's okay. Then, then, thanks a lot. So I'll see you on Thursday. Okay.